when did basketball finally click? When was your aha moment where you realized basketball was what you wanted to do? Yeah, I have a unique journey. I'm the youngest of three and grew up in Western Pennsylvania in a crazy basketball town that back in the 70s, before it was really popular to have this kind of um, organized basketball league, in my hometown, just a tiny little town in Northwestern Pennsylvania, we were playing organized leagues as early as third grade. And so I grew up in a basketball crazy town. So basketball was always a huge part of my life. My older sister was a fantastic player in our hometown. So had a great appreciation for women's sports early on in my journey. I'm nine years younger than my sister. So was one of those second and third graders keeping her stats when she was a junior and senior in high school and just really, you know, fell in love with the game. But my aha moment happened my senior year in high school. I decided not to play a fall high school sport to prepare for the upcoming senior basketball season. Again, in a very, very, um, very crazy, I called it a Hoosier type town in uh, Northwest Pennsylvania. It was just the entire town came out and watched the basketball teams play. But in the fall um, of my senior year, it became apparent that no teacher wanted to coach the girls seventh and eighth grade team. And at that time, uh, when I was a senior in the mid eighties, you had to be a teach, you had to be a teacher in the school district to coach and they couldn't find a, a teacher that wanted to coach. So my varsity coach approached me, knew I had interest in women's basketball, knew I had interest in being a coach uh, in my future and asked me if I would coach the team as a senior in high school. So that was my aha moment. I coached the seventh and eighth grade girls team, my senior year in high school, uh, my teammate and I. And uh, it was just, that's what I wanted to do. I knew it. I was hooked. We had a good season. I had fun with the girls that I was only four years older than. Uh, but it was that moment that solidified that I really wanted to try to chase coaching as a profession. Bowling Green University was your first stop as a head coach. Before you got there, what were some lessons that you learned that prepared you for that job when you took it on? Yes, yeah, spent 11 years as an assistant coach at the Division I level. I had great mentors, had great people that I learned from. And what I took away from each one of them, I took away a little bit as I built my own philosophy. But uh, for me, it was culture. It was creating uh, a championship team in the locker room before you could have a championship team on the court. And uh, really bought into that, that teams could overachieve, teams could really win at a high level if you created something very special in the locker room. So this was before the fun coaches cliches about championships are won in the locker room. It was before you heard that, but it was really uh, ingrained on me by some good mentors. Um, and I really, when I got my opportunity in 2001 to be a division one head coach, that's what I set out to do. It was all about culture building. It was all about winning in that locker room first. And you know the grind of mid-major Division I basketball, where sometimes you play the bigger schools, you punch them in the mouth. Sometimes they don't really see it coming. But what was the driving force of those teams? I mean, you went to the NCAA tournament five times while you were there. So what was the driving force of those teams? And how did that carry over into what you do now with the Suns? Yeah, what we were so proud of was our sustained success. Uh, after the first two years of rebuilding at Bowling Green, we had nine straight seasons of 21 or more wins. We won the regular season eight straight years, my last eight years. Um, you know, it's very rare to win a conference that many times in a row. You can count on one hand the college coaches that have done it. We were able to build something very, very sustainable, and that was what was so impressive. Um, we went to postseason those last eight, uh, eight straight years, five times for the NCAA tournament. We were a one-bid league, so you had to win the MAC Conference tournament when we were at Bowling Green, uh, but we, we had a tremendous run. We were able to go to the Sweet 16 one of those years, built, mid, built Bowling Green into one of the mid-major powers during that time, and we're really proud of it. We're, we're not afraid to play the Power Five conferences, we're not afraid to go toe to toe with them. It only made us better. But, you know, what I'm so proud of is that we never had in a, in a transfer era, 
We never had a player transfer after they began their sophomore year. I never had a coaching staff member leave in my 11 years at Bowling Green, which contributed mightily to our success was our consistency of our staff, but it was a sustained success. It was that championship locker room. We really created a family environment. We created Bowling Green really drew well. Uh, the fan base really jumped on the bandwagon and it was just a truly special time and a, and a, a fantastic place to coach. Still really special in my heart. Bowling Green is still really special in my heart. Was the WNBA always on your radar in terms of taking that next step or were you content to remain at Bowling Green before you went to uh, Indiana? You know, it was really focused uh, at the collegiate level. And when the WNBA plays in the summer months, you are knee deep in, in recruiting and you're on the road for weeks at a time. And so probably a little bit embarrassingly say, I didn't follow the early years of the WNBA as closely as probably I should have. Um, but I really got into the WNBA when I started recruiting Taylor Agler, her dad, Brian Agler, uh, was someone I looked up to, was a head coach in the league. Um, and we became even closer during that time and, and really started to follow the league through the recruitment of his daughter. And lo and behold, when I left Indiana after having Taylor, you know, commit to us at Indiana and play for us her freshman year at Indiana, it was Brian Agler who brought me to the WNBA uh, and gave me a shot at the professional rank. So, um, you know, forever indebted to him giving me the shot uh, at, the pro, at the pro level. You spend one year at Brian Agler's side, you get the keys to Connecticut, who even though they've got a robust college basketball history that really didn't even really need to be mentioned at times, how, when you started building up the Connecticut Sun when you got there, did you notice sort of the different degrees of attention people played to the difference between like paying attention to the Huskies and paying attention to the Sun? And how did you deal with that? Yeah, first, the, uh, the, I was not looking. I, I didn't realize I could become a head coach in the WNBA that quickly. But, you know, that one year was invaluable under Brian Agler. He taught me so much about the league. He was so, such a great mentor. If I would have come directly from a head coaching position in college to a head coaching position in the pros, I wouldn't have been equipped. I wouldn't have been equipped to been able to the, the differences in the game and handle it. That year in LA under Brian really set me up to have the success that we're having now. Um, through a very quick process, I think through, you know, I, I've never been the first choice at any job that I've landed. I don't think I was the first choice in Connecticut. It took a few really big names to turn it down. And all of a sudden I became on their radar more than anything because Gino recommended me. And so, um, you know, I was right place at the right time. All of a sudden, I found myself taking over Connecticut, who was very much in a rebuild mode. They hadn't been to the WNBA playoffs for three straight years. We knew um, we had some rebuilding to do. Uh, in terms of what I walked into fan base wise, you know, certainly the state of Connecticut is so appreciative of good women's basketball. And that, that's directly credited to UConn. We have such an educated fan base for women's basketball in the state. And certainly we have crossover. Those UConn great fans, we have a lot of them that become Connecticut Sun fans in the summer. But we do have our own fan base. We do have our own fan base. And I learned that quickly that didn't necessarily follow the Huskies. So we're benefiting from dual support of Husky fans that are also Sun fans. But there is a fraction of our fan base that is clearly a professional women's basketball fan and don't follow the Huskies as closely. And, uh, you know, that became apparent right away, but it's so blessed, you know, to coach in a state that reveres women's basketball, supports women's basketball, and is really educated about women's basketball. You mentioned that Gino referred you for the Connecticut Sun job. How, how has your relationship been and how did you even meet? You know, Gino was, uh, you know, a tremendous uh, role model for me. I caught a break early in my coaching career at the Division One level and became the recruiting coordinator and assistant coach at Syracuse at the age of 25. And that was in the Big East days, the real Big East days, back in the, in the, in the monster 90s of the Big East. Oh, yeah. And, you know, everyone was trying to chase UConn. 
and we were trying to rebuild a Syracuse program. And so while we're on the road, you know, I befriended Chris Daly, befriended Gino, and they just saw, you know, a young coach willing to grind and not, not afraid to ask advice. And, you know, I would go up and speak to them and they were so kind to me. They were so generous to me. I think they saw how hard I was working on the recruiting trails to try to bring um, Syracuse to another level that just a friendship developed. And as my career moved on from the mid nineties and a Syracuse assistant, we continued to stay in touch. And then as my head coaching career started at Bowling Green and I had success at the division one level, obviously I earned respect from Gino and Chris and company. And uh, we had always stayed in contact. And when a couple of the former Yukon, you know, legacy tree was not involved in the Connecticut Sun, you know, job, then it was very apparent that Gino felt comfortable recommending me saying, you have a really good coach as an assistant coach in that league. Have you looked at Kurt Miller and his endorsement to get the front office to look at me just started a process and we really hit it off and I was in the right place at the right time. And speaking of that UConn connection, the new team president is Jen Rosati, who's won championships there and even turned the University of Hartford women's program into really an America East program of stature. What's your relationship with her like? How do you guys interact? Rather, how do you folks interact maybe on a day-to-day -day basis or in any other way? Yeah, first, uh, you know, our relationship goes back to when she was the head coach at Hartford and I was the head coach at Bowling Green. We both had two really successful programs um, and we, you know, mid-majors, it's hard to schedule. No one wants to play you. And so we had a series uh, and we split that series. And it was great because we were all trying to have bragging rights as one of the top five mid-major teams. And Jen had a really good team at Hartford. And so we had a great series. So we had great respect. Again, Jen was a player at UConn when I was at Syracuse as an assistant. I give her a hard time still. It's one of the big wins in Syracuse women's basketball history when we upset UConn and Jen was a part of that team. So um, she has she has Olympic gold medals and national championships and all this bragging rights. But I still remember when our Syracuse team beat that UConn team. So, but we have a great relationship. And um, when when there was a change at D GW recently, we had an unexpected change in our franchise, and we lost our vice president Amber Cox, who I worked so closely together. And I personally immediately picked up the phone to Mohican leadership and said, I'm not sure what role, I'm not sure where she fits, but we have to get Jen Rosati to our organization. And I was bullish about it. And to Mohican leadership credit, they really went to work on it. And the same story goes with Morgan Tuck, who I drafted and coach and unfortunately had to retire prematurely from the WNBA with her long history of injuries, but she's another UConn great that I also said as soon as she retired from Seattle last year is we had to get Morgan Tuck back in our franchise. Looking down the road after those phone calls and great work by Mohican leadership, uh, team president Jen Rosati now, and then another important uh, business front office person, Morgan Tuck, both great UConn legends. So happy that uh, Mohican went to work and, and got them on board. Coaching in the WNBA is unlike any other job in sports, especially when you consider not just the athletes that you're coaching, but the stances that the league takes on many other things. I saw your tweet the other day um, talking about how Pride Night became such finally a, a big thing for an organization and a league to really be behind. Um, you're the you are you were the first uh, openly gay basketball coach, professional basketball coach, head coach at that. Um, I've read about how you know you sort of struggled with wishing you were you came out a little bit sooner in your role now how do you sort of adopt that role of being the trailblazer whether you embrace it or not it's kind of what you are so how do you how do you deal with it yeah it's interesting my my history is when i became a head coach in 2001 <clears throat> i was really comfortable in my skin and i was out i was an out gay male coach at the division 1 level which was very rare uh, but it was in the women's basketball circles. It was with my team, my coaches, my administration, our fan base, our recruits, the women's basketball coaches nationwide knew, but, but it was just such a small circle. It was that women's basketball family. Uh, outside of that, 
there was not a lot of a, a national attention. One, I didn't get asked a lot about it in interviews, even though I introduced my partner at the time and our two children, um, you know, always at public functions. They were always a part. They were part of my Indiana University press conference. Um, but, you know, there's just no national stories. And so therefore, I wasn't being a role model. I wasn't being a great trailblazer because I wasn't reaching people and representation uh, and visibility matters. When I became the head coach at Connecticut, a national story was done uh, by Out Sports, which then blossomed into some New York Times articles and other more nationally known publications. And all of a sudden, the visibility and representation mattered. Um, I, you know, I regret years gone by because I didn't have any role models. I didn't look at that gay male coach thriving in team sports uh, on the sidelines, playing uh, in the front offices. There wasn't that gay male that you could look to. And so visibility and representation matters. I always wondered about advancement. I always wondered if I, there was going to be a plateau. And I've always worked so hard because I felt like I needed to succeed more than someone else if I ever wanted to uh, continue to rise in our profession and challenge myself at the highest levels. I, my biggest you know, goal now, my legacy I hope to leave is that youth, is that young gay male that is struggling in middle school, struggling in high school in that locker room and wonders if they can thrive in team sports. Can they be a part of teams? Uh, do they fit in? Where do they fit in? Is there enough role models? And you're starting to see professional men's athletes in different sports come out over this year, and it's just tremendous. Um, I hope that they can look to me as someone that's thrived on the sidelines. And it doesn't matter who you love or what your sexuality is. Gay males can thrive in team sports. There's a place for us. And hopefully someday this isn't a story at all, but right now it is, there's still work to be done and it is a story. And I'm proud to be, you know, one of the only gay male professional coaches, um, especially in North America. And I, I take that role, you know, very seriously. And I hope I can give back mainly to the youth and, and give them some visibility and representation. How do you think that with everything that you said, how do you feel like that uniquely positions you to run such a successful WNBA team, especially considering where the league is and the stances and, and how upfront they've been about issues? Yeah, I think the, the big thing is the team knows I'm authentic and, you know, I champion people, you know, being true. And, and living them their lives. Our league is unbelievable to be a part of because these women lead in social activism, in, in social change. Um, our women in the WNBA are forefront leaders. They're trailblazers. They are doing things for social justice um, that other leagues aren't. And we're not afraid to stand up um, you know, for what we believe. And uh, I, I I just marvel at being able to work with these amazing women around the league. We call it 144. There's not quite that in the league right now, but 140 of the most amazing women that, you know, really have found their voice and are fighting for the right causes. And by them seeing me live authentically and being true to myself, they know I have their back and truly support them in what they believe in and what they believe they need to fight for and I'm behind them every step of the way with the year that this team has had broken records and especially trying to build off of the success of that bubble season what's special about this group that you have yeah it's that locker room it, it truly is a championship culture we have a great balance of veteran leaders and it's not one voice sometimes you have a great leader sorry Sometimes you have a great leader and that is, you know, really important, but we have leaders. And so it's, um, it has been remarkable to hear a lot of different voices, a lot of different leaders in that locker room. And then we have young, young players that bring so much energy um, and excitement and give to each other. Um, 
they're so unselfish. Uh, there's individuals that have probably deserve more individual shine on them, but they have sacrificed some own individual shine for the betterment of the team and a style of play that we've decided to play this year. And because of that, um, you know, it's really worked and we buy into it, believe in it. Uh, we're a defensive oriented team, a rebounding team. We're going to set records as the best rebounding team in the history of the league. And that's a big part of our success. So a um, lot of work to be done, a lot of pressure on our shoulders as a franchise that hasn't won a championship yet. Uh, there is a, a ton of talented teams getting ready to start the playoffs. We are the hottest team. Doesn't mean we're the best team. The best team stays healthy. Knock on wood, we got to stay healthy. Uh, but we look forward to, you know, continuing to build the momentum on this great season we're having. You've got the double bye best possible situation you could be, especially as the number one overall seed. You almost had a trial run, I would say, with the Olympic break this year because of the amount of time that your players got to come back and that you also got to really recharge. How do you, once your seat, once the regular season ends, how do you approach that stretch of time before you even figure out who you play in the semis? Yeah, it's got to be a balance of rest and then trying to stay in rhythm. Uh, we came back from that long post-Olympic break and we immediately played in the Commissioner's Cup game, a first annual event in our league, earned the right to play in the Commissioner's Cup and, and really had a stinker. You know, we, we just didn't play well. And, you know, we've got to avoid that coming back because we will not have played for 11 days as we go into the, the semifinal game one. So we've got to try to find a balance of rest uh, but staying sharp, staying ready. Uh, as you always know, game one in a series is always one of the toughest games and is the one that your opponents want to steal on your home court. So, um, you know, we're going to we're going to strike a balance and work really hard to be ready for the semifinals when they begin. All right, coach, is there anything that you would like our viewers to know before uh, we sign off? You know, ch challenge everyone to continue to make good choices with this COVID, but we really need your support. You know, we, we could really use a filled arena for uh, this playoff run. Uh, we believe this team is special. They deserve uh, the fan support. I understand we're still in a pandemic and a COVID time, but if you feel comfortable, um, I, I beg you to get out and support this team. They're not only great players, that have put themselves in position to be the number one seed, they're more importantly, great humans and, and a team that this state would take a ton of pride in supporting. So, you know, I really encourage if you're comfortable